top of the morning. Hi, Elena Verna. Welcome to the product tea with Leah, where we spill the tea on everything that has probably to do with business product growth and some other things that make that uh, there are a lot of fun in the industry. Can you introduce yourself to the audience if for some magical reason someone doesn't know you? <laughs> Hi, Leah. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Elena Verna. I do all things B2B growth uh, within product-led growth model for scaling companies um, that are post-product market fit, but well before their second horizon on product development. Uh, I do growth advising as my main uh, gig. I advise incredible companies such as Clockwise or Veed, um, Chris, MongoDB, and many others, as well as I do interim executive engagements uh, with companies to help them prototype head of growth roles or growth departments in general, such as um, Amplitude, Netlify, Miro. Those are some of the ones that I've done it at. But I love everything that has to do with growth models and helping tech grow and scale products. So excited to be here. That's really amazing. Okay, let me introduce you back to yourself, right? Because that's what people always usually come from. Like, they always want to hear what I think about them for some reason. Let's just go with this, right? Like, how do I know you? I know you from a course on Reforge. I think it was the monetization course. And uh, Reforge was one of the more defining resources in my life, which was the first time a lot of the stuff that I assumed to be correct was actually turning out to be not so good. And some of it was actually good. And then it formalized it in a way that is you know, for me, graspable. It really speaks to me and I learned a lot from it um, in that sense. And that's, that's, that, that's a really awesome thing. And the funny thing about you is, is that you talked to me when I was really little. I mean, not in terms of my own age, like when I was really little on LinkedIn. And I had no followers, nothing. But I reached out to Elena because your stuff meant a lot to me. And I don't know exactly what like what we talked about, but like that, so you talked to me, right? That was really sticking to me and you, we were really accessible and engaging and I started to respond on yourself. And then I also had my um, ambitious plan to take over the world and start to also post on, on LinkedIn. And the funny thing is, is that, and we can talk about this, but like the funny thing is, is for some reason, your background is completely different than mine. I think you coming from marketing and analytics. So from the quantitative side, if I, if I don't misremember, and I'm coming from the UX research, so like the qualitative understanding um, side and from product. And we somehow seem to have the same opinions on a lot of topics. So we get to the same conclusions, but I don't understand sometimes how. And that is a lot of fun to me. And um, I think you also just hit the most interesting fact about you besides the professional side, which is also like the meme creation. You're an absolute monster when it comes to memes. And... I love getting up in the morning, unironically, I'm not just saying this, I love getting up in the morning and hopefully like, oh yeah, you know, like, maybe maybe today is the day where Elena posts another meme and then we can have a funny go back and forth. So um, that is something that I really appreciate. And it's, it's a part of my day. I know this sounds weird, but it's a part of my day, you know, to go back and forward on LinkedIn. It's a lot of fun and you're a part of it. So that's, that's your relevance in my life in that sense. Was that accurate? No, I appreciate or, it. Yeah. Uh, I do love Reforge. Reforge is a way for me to really give back to community and help scale knowledge and really walk away from data points and help people see patterns and enable them with frameworks to solve problems at scale, as opposed to coming up with pointing solutions every single time. So Reforge is definitely my passion. Um, monetization experimentation courses were my first ones. I'm super excited that I'm creating two more. But um, LinkedIn has been more of my recent development because I really started investing into it last year as I went into solopreneur journey. And now I need to build my own pipeline of clients. So I took on freemium model for myself of post my findings because frameworks are fairly empty if you do not know how to implement them. So yeah. I decided to just share as much of my knowledge as possible and then uh, really help companies operationalize it. But like you said, during that, you start meeting really meaningful people and building incredible connections, you yeah. being one of them. So I'm excited to see that other benefit out of it that I've never actually expected to see, but that human connection that comes with it is pretty incredible. And I really enjoy it as well. Yeah, it is. It is a lot of fun. So let me share one more thing with you. This is quite funny because I never told you this. Um, uh, so like when we think about product like growth that we talk a lot about, I think you do it more from, yeah, you know, like your corner and I do it from my corner, but we're kind of talking about the same thing. Um, 
and exposing yourself, or like managing yourself like a PLG product, right? This is what you're saying, right? Like you're making yourself accessible and it can go. So I kind of, I kind of tried to do this as well as a very specific thing. And before I tell you what it is, um, this is something that I appreciate about you as well. You're always very specific in what you say. It's not, you're not someone that says, oh, influence your stakeholders. You say, you go to the CFO and then you ask this and this and this and this, right? This is, this is who you are. And that's what I really love. And I try to do the same in the content of the stuff that I do. So here's the idea that I had. I figured that if I have, you know, you have different content on LinkedIn in the sense of like some of your posts are high performing, you know, like you get, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000 engagements, whatever. So they drive a lot of traffic. So people are starting to read this, right? So these are my free users. Some of those I can retain in a sense that they go to my profile. They want to check out the product more. And I always make sure that at any time, no matter when you come to my profile on LinkedIn, that there is a video of me somewhere. So I don't care about how much engagement these videos give. You know, like I have these opinion pieces and stuff where I kind of look quite smart and everything. <laughs> but I want them to always be able to engage with a video of myself so they see who I am. And I believe that this is actually driving inbound leads because I'm treating my LinkedIn page now like a landing page. And you also mm. helped me optimize this. Like, you know, we went through the CV, like, oh, yeah, that's not good, right? Like, so we need to change this and that. And you helped me with this in, uh, when I had my last crisis <laughs> for like five months ago. But the thing is really, I'm, I'm starting to treat it this way. And like you, I think there is no, from the monetization that we do, which is the inbound links that are coming in, there's no friction from the free users that are consuming our content at any point, right? We're not putting anything behind the paywall and anything. And you're doing the same. So um, yeah, I don't know what my point there is, but I think, I think that's my kind of view on it. I'd, I'd never thought about it that as a freemium model. But I kind of do the same with my LinkedIn kind of profile page. It's highly optimized for this. I want people to see who I am, how I talk, and how I speak at any time. Well, that depends on what you actually want to achieve within your freemium then. Because yeah. all of the content, it's meant to get you to not only aha moment with me, but to habit moment with me mm -hmm. or with you. So what is the habit moment? And actually what you want to feature then on your LinkedIn profile, I think will highly depend on what kind of monetization you want to trigger potentially out of that freemium activation that you're doing. Yeah. So I get a lot of people into habit loops. I never hope to monetize them just because there's tangential indirect monetization ways of them word of mouth referring me or sharing yeah. my content. And that's plenty. I really don't care about anything else. Some of them will go into inbound with me, but I think it depends. Like if you want to do a lot of public speaking and you can monetize that quite a bit, then I would probably do more maybe visual content for myself, but I'm also a huge introvert. So I try to avoid those at all costs yeah. and stay behind obfuscated content so I can just post my thoughts and not have to necessarily present them myself. You are far more extroverted. So it would make sense for you to Stop push towards that. that way. Yes, yes, you are. So I, I look for more, I think, introverted type of engagements. And um, I, I no, I hear you. LinkedIn profile is super important. What you put on it, you should read it twice, three times, and make sure that it actually represents you. Not only just in your bio or like in your headline, but really about how you even present your jobs and stuff. People judge you based on it, yeah. whether we like it or not. So you have to pay attention to it. Okay, well, you went into the introvert thing, so I'm going to push back on it. So let's go. Um, so here's the thing, right? Leah has ADHD, and I'm very loud and everything. But the one thing that I really enjoy about LinkedIn is that I can talk to people, and I can just close the windows that of those that I do not want to engage with. I'm extremely awkward in person with people that just want to talk to me because I'm Leah. And that makes me extremely uncomfortable like in a sense of like oh i love your content and everything and then they expect me to say something to this um that's my introvert side i know you don't believe me i know you don't but don't. it's just because i'm no but just because no but nobody does like this like absolutely nobody of my in my in, in my circles except my best friends know that i'm just i don't like this i really do not like this it makes me extremely uncomfortable and i'm getting super uncomfortable with big masses of people Unless, for some reason, when I stand on the stage and can talk to them, or I'm learning something and it's not really loud around me. Like, noise is tripping me over hard. And I also remember that, like, 
I did. I had a consulting business about 15 years ago. I tried to make something work, but not not in the space of product management. It was you know like fixing computers and offering web services and web design and all that kind of stuff. And it made me extremely uncomfortable to acquire people, you know, like to do acquisition, to go to people and speak to them and like I don't know, put an advert out or whatever. But for some reason, the entire LinkedIn thing that you kind of also showed me that it works works for me. I really enjoy it because people approach me. They, I know already when they approach me, there is some, you know, when someone writes like, hey, can you help us? Our product is burning or something like this. You have these inbound leads. That's, that is like, okay, cool. They trust me so much that they want to spend money on this because of my skills. And that gives me a lot of confidence that I never had in my life. And, and this is how I say it. So no matter whether you believe me or not, just because I'm loud does not mean that I'm an extrovert. Absolutely <laughs> not. I don't, this is but, not true. But you are hitting on the very important point. Uh, putting mm -hmm. your content out there helps you qualify your acquisition. So when that actually mm -hmm. does engage with you, people already know what you think. People already understand your points of view, your frameworks. Yeah. You don't need to do as much selling. And that's powerful because you help others. You enable them with additional points of knowledge. Hopefully you push them to be better versions of themselves. And you remove the need to really qualify and acquire monetization prospects for yourself. And I don't know, that's the best of both worlds. I also think that we are, as an industry don't share enough knowledge between each other. We actually no. hold ourselves back by keeping these company secrets and not school doesn't teach you any of this. School does not teach you how to do product led growth. You have to go in real world and figure it out. Well, if you're yeah. going to go in the real world and figure out, do you really have to figure it out from scratch? And right yeah. now you do, you have to get in the company and you have to hit every single mistake and the same companies, all of the companies are hitting the same mistakes over and over again. And it's infuriating to me. We can do better in 2023, we can do better. And I think it starts with us at least trying to share our knowledge, trying to share our failures, trying to share our wins because otherwise we're just holding our whole innovation back in this entire sector. Yeah, that's true. And now I have a humble brag coming in because you said PLG is not being taught at school. Well, turns out that Lea, me, I have a product like growth guide and it's featured in an MBA at the Brigham Young University. That's amazing. So no, I just wanted to say that. Like, <laughs> no, but like that kind of stuff makes me incredibly proud and then insecure again at the same time. And I'm like, oh my God, actual people are reading this and then learning from it. But on the other hand, I'm like, hey, that's really cool. I wish I would have had something that is so right, engaging. To start with. Yeah, like just to, like as a starting point, I'm speaking to so many young entrepreneurs that are so much more educated than I was at that point in my life, by far. And that's amazing because I'm thinking like, oh my God, they have such a growth potential. If you're starting in this world and you have data figured out and you're doing this and you're doing that, and they don't even have the best self-esteem, you know, like that's the thing that always kills me. And I mean, yeah, okay. I have the same problem sometimes, but yeah, that's, 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 that's the kind of thing. Let me ask you a question. So, um, the vulnerability thing, because you kind of mentioned this, right? So like vulnerability and, and, and being, being open about the things, how they are, instead of like just pretending that everything is perfect and that you need to aspire to these impossible standards. Do you think it has helped you? And I'm speaking a little bit from my own experience here, so take it with a grain of salt. Do you think that you always had to push a little bit more in terms of to reach the same goals? You know, as a woman, as a mom, to just be sure of what you know so you're not being out-challenged all the time has actually helped you now as a consultant or like an advisor to companies? Because I'm always, like I have these impossible standards as well, right? Like I want to I wanna be sure I know before I recommend something. And it made me quite good in combating, I think, even though sometimes I'm like not sure whether it's good enough. Do you, can you mirror the sentiment? Do you feel the same? I think you're touching on something else as well, which is imposter syndrome, yeah. which many people that have unrealistic standards for themselves feel no matter how good or bad you are, if you have unrealistic version of yourself that you set based on expectation from the outside that you absorb upon yourself, then you have a really hard time hitting it. Even, even, even if you're there, you feel like you're not there. So mm. I definitely have, 
I've always had a very huge imposter syndrome only because I was sitting there and there's always somebody that has more years of experience or have been in a similar situation or is older than you. And therefore you assume that they know better. The piece that I've always kind of stepped back and look at that is if you are very sure in yourself, you can have a superiority complex or mm -hmm. you can be unsure in yourself and you can have an imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is often equated in a very negative light, but I actually think it can be a very useful trait in people. I'd, I choose being imposter any day over having superiority complex because I want to know my stuff. I want to understand what I'm saying. I want to have, I want to yeah. be able to back it up and back it up not only with data, with hopefully experience or at least a framework to pattern match that, hey, I've done this here before and now I believe that something that applies here, but let's learn. But the piece with imposter syndrome that you do need to fix in order to succeed in corporate world is to fake the confidence. You might feel unsure on the inside, but if you're not confident on the outside, it's yeah. really hard to get into leadership. So I've always try to fake the confidence, then do my homework at 150% to make sure that I'm able to answer any question that can be possibly come my way and already have answer to it. But at mm -hmm. the same time, don't feel unsure about it because one of the biggest realizations I've had, maybe it was 10 years ago or so, I was sitting in the room and I had an idea of how to solve a problem that we were discussing, but I'm like, no, I'm not gonna bring it up because I don't think I know how will I back it up? Or how will I, I think mm -hmm. the other people know better than me. And we were sitting for an hour discussing this problem. And then at the end, somebody brings up the solution that I had in the first five minutes of the meeting. They get all of the credit, they get applaud almost, and we mm -hmm. go and we implement it. And I look back at that meeting and it was really an enlightening moment for me because I'm like, why didn't I speak up? Why didn't I speak up? And that was because of a deep sense of insecurities. Yeah. Now I could have said it and the worst could have happened is people said, no, we don't like that idea or we want to move in a different direction. That would have been a really great data point for me to at least adjust myself or understand how a group makes decisions and what is the right path forward, but not speaking up because of imposter syndrome is the worst thing that you can do to yourself. And really exercising that confidence of at least probing and giving your ideas to the world and receiving feedback and iterating on it, I think is a really important yeah. trait that everybody has to learn, but it's hard. It's hard, but you know what? I still feel imposter syndrome to this day, probably every mm -hmm. single day. There's nothing more nerve wracking than clicking that post button on LinkedIn or going on this podcast with you and trying to pretend that I know what I'm talking about. But, but to me, this is just tells me I'm learning. I'm pushing myself outside yeah. of the comfort zone. I'm doing something that I know I'm going to gain data points out of. Whether they're going to be positive data points or negative data points actually doesn't matter. If it's negative data points, it's even better because then I know I learned something new. So from that perspective, um, that vulnerability, mm -hmm. that imposter syndrome, everybody feels it. It doesn't go away. Just lean into it and be the yeah. best version of yourself. Yeah. Um... This is quite interesting to me because I I don't know whether I approached it from a different perspective and I landed again at the same place, but maybe, yeah. So in my, in my journey into this, uh, I also, like, by the way, I also feel about it every day the same way, right? So like, not in terms of, I have different triggers than you, for sure. I think so. Like for me, it's always like, I'm deathly afraid of making mistakes that affect other people negatively. I have sure. to, like, I just think That's that terrifying. Like, whether I'm not doing something is a decision. It's also a decision, right? Or like whether I'm doing it. Yeah. So that's the first thing. And the other thing is that I think for me, um, I always, I don't, like, I always was curious about the world, right? Like I could not stand not knowing, right? That's like, that's kind of the basis of curiosity. And I think you're a little bit the same, right? Like you love learning, like you love getting somewhere and then, okay, now I'm here. Okay. Now where can I go next? Right. And the thing that always held me back for so long until I was 38, not lying, right? Like 38, like four years ago was I could not get over the fact that deep in myself, I thought that if I am 
demonstrating some vulnerability, and for me, not knowing was a vulnerability, that other people will change the way that they evaluate me. I was always afraid that people would think less of me in the sense of, oh, she doesn't know, right? And I was insufferable as a result of it. I was so insecure. And the, the, the method that I found out of this for myself with the very few friends that I have, whatever that means, but I have very few meaningful connections with people, is that I had to learn through continuous honesty and ass whooping from my friends that despite all the criticism, they always held on to me. And that gave me, for the first time at some point then, the security to say, like, you've seen me in every one of my vulnerabilities, in everything that I am, in every weakness that I have, you know, like the things that I messed up and everything, and you're still holding on to me. And it was very hard for my mind to reject this idea then that this is, so my hypothesis fell apart. You know, like if this would have been an experiment, my hypothesis fell apart, right? And I, I understood like, hey, not knowing is actually not a weakness, you know? And it took me way too long to realize this. And then at some point I started to do it really extreme on, on, on LinkedIn. And the, I think the height of this, and then I stopped talking about this, but like there was this one event that, where I pushed it to the limit. I stood in front of the entire company and I had an event where I talked very, very specifically about a failure that I had with Miro, you know, like a partnership that I messed up. I was not just saying like, hey, I messed something up. I was standing there and I named names and I described the entire situation and apologized to my team, but not in a bad way, in a sense of like, you know, oh, I'm so sorry. It was just like, look, here's how it was. And this was the decision that I took. And it was so empowering because nothing happened afterwards. Nobody came to me and said something bad. The opposite was the case again, right? And this gave me so much security because I started to realize this vulnerability is actually a strength. And I found kind of strength in this. So I still have the imposter syndrome. But the, the power of I cannot stand to not know is now stronger, right? So like it pushes through it and it keeps me in check as well a little bit. I don't know. Like I think I guess that's how I kind of approach it. I only want to add one thing to to this. When we were kids, we have really heightened growth mindset. We know yeah. nothing, and we learn through failures. We trip, we fall. Okay, I should avoid these types of trip hazards before. We burn our hand. We're like, okay, I should not touch the hot surface anymore. Yeah. We, I don't know kick somebody and we're like, oh, that had a really bad reaction. I should not do this anymore. And then we go to school and that growth mindset is kicked out of us because in the school, you almost, you, you're rewarded for having a fixed mindset. You even, you either know it or you don't. And that's how you evaluate it. And then we take that fixed mindset that our qualities and our behaviors define us and our success will depend on which qualities we already possess right now. Mm -hmm. And we bring it to the workplace. And then the workplace is exaggerated by the corporate culture where we're supposed to be not vulnerable. We are supposed to be successful. Only winners get rewarded. And we mm -hmm. have to have this version of ourselves that is always just winning, winning, winning. And it's, it's very sad to me because the best people have growth mindset. They know that they don't know anything right now and they will learn it tomorrow or they will learn yeah. it in the future. And your success will change based on your ability to learn. So I think I, I, I train myself to look at any failure that I have, and I have failures on every single day to look at it as an area for opportunity and learning, but it doesn't help that even on LinkedIn, it's like an Instagram of your professional career. Everything is seen through the filter of successes and yeah. everything is rosy and unicorns and rainbows and butterflies are flying all the way around. And it's hard because it's hard to see that people do fail, people do learn because yeah. we're kind of showing off in front of each other. And you know, I try to be as human as possible. It's obviously hard. There's internet obfuscates some of it, but I do hope that people realize that they need to get back into that kid's zone, that growth yeah. mindset of I will learn and I will fail and failure is a normal part of learning. And it's something that we should celebrate a hell of a lot more than we do yeah. now. I'm very grateful that we can do this, right? Like that we can talk about things like this also on my podcast, which is going to be live at some point. And you're also posting about very vulnerable things. I also put myself out there. I have a specific border now that I found for myself, I think, but 
um people love it when when you're honest right like this is the thing like you know honesty it's it's not it's not it it's part of it's kind of becoming part of a brand almost because now i feel like <laughs> i as soon as i would like put on something that is not honest anymore people would call me out for it <laughs> so like it's like it's almost like a a different kind of accountability which i love but yeah so the thing that you said about the kids is very true and um i almost got crushed by this like in my life in the sense that i always had this idea of i have to be a specific type of person because of expectations of other people and you know i heard always also in school like Leah, you need to be like this. You need to be like that. And uh, you you need to be more quiet and uh, you need to do this, right? So like in one of the experiences that I actually remember very vividly was I was forced in school as one of the last kids in Switzerland, at, at one of the last, um, how do you say, like years of birth or whatever, birth years, that was forced to write with the other hand. So I'm left-handed, mm-hmm. right? And we had these ink pens always in school and I had to switch and what happened is, is that I, I don't know the physiological connection to it, but what happened is I started stuttering. And I started so hard that for someone that talks as much as me, right, like I have no filter, the things are just coming out. I started to get embarrassed whenever I was talking because I was constantly stuttering and then things got worse and worse and worse. And I, you know how kids are, you know, like that's on the other hand, right? Like in school, we teach, we we learn how to be really cruel to each other sometimes as well because of this entire system, right? So like, oh, look at this person. She does not belong into the same group and everything. Do so, they conform to the standard that we've erected that this yeah. is the mold that you have to fit? Yeah. And if you do not fill that mold, off you go. Now you're awkward. Now you, you're not part of the group or whatever other label that you, that you absorb. And yeah. it sucks. It, it, yeah, it's, it was, it was, it was bad. And I got really, really good in pretending that I belong to the other group. And that's the thing, right? Like we're all becoming actors of this kind of group. So I'm very, very grateful that I can just be myself. So (laughs) I can honestly say that LinkedIn is a part of my therapy. It gave me freedom in many, many aspects. And for so far, people seem to like it. So, Hey, that's even better, you know, to have a voice Um, and having a voice is important because then you have an outlet to actually use it. Yeah, how beautiful it is it if it if it is even your own voice, and I can just yes. every encourage everybody to do this, right? So listen to Elena. That's good. That's good advice. So there you go. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. Hey, let's also talk about some professional things. Um, maybe if you want to, right? Of course. Sure, let's do it. Um, so have you ever heard about um, PQAs? <laughs> so it's just like that was. <laughs> Bam! PQAs. <laughs> PQAs. Can you explain to the audience what a PQA is? Um, I have to step back. I cannot start <laughs> yes, probably. PQA, but I don't think that is possible. <laughs> so in B2B, we've all sudden woke up one day and we found that we can build products for end users and not just enterprise buyers. This awakening has happened probably about five to six years ago, where we all sudden realized that not only enterprise buyers can make decisions within companies of what software to use, but end users can too. Mind blown. Now, why did this actually happen? This actually happened because enterprise buyers did used to make all of the decisions for software purchases within um, enterprises. But then uh, the, pe- the list that they would collect of requirements did not actually match to what people wanted. Because what I think I want versus what I actually end up needing to do in the product um, is quite different. Plus, the same function can be very unusable, even if it produces the same utilitarian um, effect in one product versus the next. And it created a lot of utilization issues within B2B. And those utilization issues hurt enterprise buyers' hearts because they spent all of this time prototyping and selecting a product, and then they're paying ridiculous amount of money for it, and then nobody's using it. Here comes PLG businesses that are targeting end users directly, and they're sweeping in under the radar like a Trojan horse into the organization. Users love it, and then they ask enterprise buyer to purchase it, as opposed to this requirement coming top down. And all of a sudden, PLG is born. Listen, this is nothing new. B2C has been doing it for ages. They've always went after end user because that is the consumer for them. In B2B, we all of a sudden realize that we can actually go after end users. Good for us. We have lots to catch up to, to B2C. B2C, please keep leading the way so we can continue following you. But there's one thing that there is has to 
that we still have to address. How do we start with the user and then how do we end up selling into organization? Those two are not the same thing. And in fact, there's quite a bit of a gap between the two that you can potentially create uh, not even realizing it. And the gap is usually because not every single usage or a product user that you can generate within your company, within your application can be translated into an actual sales contract. Because fundamentally, every single B2B business still wants to close an enterprise contract because market likes it. Market likes those contracts. It's stability, it's security. It feels so good. It smells like money. So we goal our B2B businesses to go after enterprise contracts. So now we have in PLG a dilemma. How do you start with an end user? But how do you escalate it all the way to an enterprise contract? Enter PQA. PQA is a product qualified account. Product qualified account basically ensures that the usage that you generate within the product can actually be translated to pipeline. That's all it is because not all usage can be an equals pipeline for enterprise sales. You might have a very happy prosumer that will never ask for an enterprise contract or not if you need an enterprise contract. We can also have a very happy team that will never be on an escalator to an enterprise deal. PQA is additional state of engagement in the product that is after setup, after aha, possibly after habit moment, possibly even after core frequency of engagement that ensures that based on the volume, velocity, feature breadth, or some behavioral aspects of usage in the product that signal that this is the right time to sales involve themselves. So it's another step of engagement. And we in B2B really need to drive it because otherwise we create a lot of happy users and a lot of unhappy sales reps that cannot monetize those users. Or even worse, we create usage that just not, cannot be monetized at all, even if it's self-serve monetization. So you really have to think about how do I unlock a user, a team within my company, but then how do I create an escalator within product to foster yeah. sales engagement? Exactly. So you already said everything. So that's the end of the podcast. No. So, okay. So here's how I... All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye. That was it. No, no, no. So here's how I educate sales organizations, because there you have to do actually most of the education, right? So like there's two types of accounts that are usually coming in, in terms of, okay, you know, we want to do the PLG thing. <laughs> Either it's a company that already has very good data gathering, you know, like, and they're like, I don't know, they have very good knowledge of the customer's uh, success metrics and all of this kind of stuff. Or it's a sales-led company that heard about product-led sales, but they don't want to do PLG, right? That's kind of in their mind, the story that they have. And usually the way that I'm going in there is kind of the same, but I do it with a, with a correlation analysis or like a correlation kind of tree. I say always, okay, so you want to have the best product in the world, right? And I say, yes. Of course. Okay. So what do you need to do to do this? Well, you need to create revenue because revenue is a very clear signal that someone finds this valuable and so forth. So we can pour. So what value generates capture. a lot of... I mean, you can exactly. capture value back. Yeah. Exactly. You capture that value, right? And then salespeople love this, right? So like, oh yeah, revenue. Oh yeah. Mm. Oh, revenue in the morning, you know, like, it's like mm. okay. So what do we do? <laughs> what do we... <laughs> Give me some of that revenue. <laughs> so, so what do we do? Um to get revenue and then they say well we have a great product oh, okay so like what is correlated to having a great product well people using the product okay so you know like then we create this entire tree together wouldn't it be nice to know when these particular things happen so you can close your contracts better and then they start to kind of understand oh okay so what you're saying is is that you can help me qualify my leads yeah you can make more money with your incentivization that's usually not the entire story because you also need to prepare them that, unfortunately, we cannot just give you all the money when you sign the contracts, right? We also now make you responsible for the success of this client. And that's what product-led growth in the end is. It doesn't matter how you call it, right? It's about customer centricity in the end. If you are getting rewarded that your customer is successful, and that means five licenses now, 200 in a year, then you're going to make sure that this also happens, right? Sales always works with a very strong incentivization background. So does marketing and so does product. We just need to change the goals and these incentivizations. So 
I'm not sure I added actually value to what you said, um, but that would be my definition. But you actually bring up a good point of incentives. So sales are incentivized by quota attainment on this quarter. And there is an issue with standard sales incentivization that is focused on land ARR only when you're trying to do product-led sales. Because A, they actually then incentivize to compete against self-serve monetization channels. And you cannot allow for that. You actually have to make it more lucrative for them to send a customer to self-serve if the customer can succeed in self-serve and not hoard them towards quota. So that is usually achieved by just giving a multiple on a self-serve close to any sales uh, rep that is owning the account. And then the second of all, expansion. Expansion, expansion, it's all about expansion. Product-led sales is land as little as possible, like at your sales floor and realize potential of the account over the years because it's not the same as a top-down sale. Top-down sale, you reach enterprise buyer when the problem is already in the high maturity state and is ready to be neutralized, so to speak, by the company by throwing money at it. In product-led sales and PLG, you enter problem in a very low maturity state. When you close your first mm -hmm. contract, it's probably years before you would have ever been able to get in touch with that top-down enterprise buyer. So you have to, you can compare, first of all, top down and product led sales. So PLG apples to apples. They're not. The time horizons are vastly different. And second of all, PLG and PLS uh, sales comp really has to be anchored around expansion. And if it's not, it's a sure way to kill product led sales. If you just incentivize your sales rep to land as big of a deal as possible from the beginning, because then they start grabbing and the horrible behavior of user signing up and the sales reaching out to you on the phone 15 minutes later going, hello, what's your budget? Are you ready to buy? I mean, it's terrible, but like it happens every single day. Uh, and, and this is where sales comp is not set up right. PQA has not been established, which gives you the right timing for engagement with sales. And you like, you trying to grab the revenue to get your fix on the quota and the, and the attainment of your forecast without actually understanding what's the right thing to do by the user and when it's the right time for them to engage with you. All right, it's time to get a little bit out there. So I'm gonna share a secret with you so nobody will know this, right? Unless they actually listen to this podcast. So let's say what you're saying is, is that salespeople in the classical way that they work, they need to expand, they need to understand what customer success really means, right? That's what we're trying to say yeah. with PQAs. And they also need to understand product a little bit more. You know, it helps to understand data in the first just place, right? Bit. But like, just a little bit. Just a little, yeah. just a little bit. Yeah. So I know that you wrote about this and I had a guide in the works for quite some time and I'm gonna tell you how it's called, right? So the guide is called product sales management. I have a hypothesis that in some constructs there is room for a team that is a product team essentially but they're focusing on establishing with hypothesis based experimentation based um processes to establish sales processes that then other sales people are taking over on like as soon as they have been proven right so imagine you have engineers you have a product manager or product sales manager and you have your designer in there, right? And you can teach this product manager, which are usually good storytellers, just like you and me, right? Um, you teach them to sell in a basic way, which is easier than teaching someone from sales how to do product. And the idea is, I think this is going to be PLG 2.0. Just wait for it. I think there will be teams that will be called like this that enable sales and just pave the way. They make sure all the dashboards are in place, you know, like because they know, oh, hmm, we should know, you know, how this goes and like what is customer success. So they, they, they're going to establish the entire process to a way where the salesperson that takes this over afterwards is the actual customer. And I think this is going to happen. I know that you wrote about this in the context of growth sales teams. Sales, sales, so, yeah. Yeah. So I think I've it's seen it. I've seen it. Back. Yeah, I've seen it happen in some capacity. So, for example, I remember mm -hmm. talking to Dropbox, and Dropbox had this self-serve sales team. If that's not yeah. a tongue twister, but that was really a, a sales team that specifically focused on upselling self-serve customers, and they were actually not not incentivized to like get on the phone with a customer. It was through chat. It was through email. It's like low touch, get them to expand on their ACV once they're ready. And they yeah. heavily understood 
not only sales process, but I believe they even sat within product work, which is like fascinating to me because they, they were product experts at the end of the day, and they were working with all of the tools and product managers on the ways to reach out. I also see in Canva, they have product-led sales uh, hire in growth team. I mm. love that concept. I want to I wanna learn more about it because I haven't seen it done at scale, and I'm curious what works and what doesn't um, about it. But I've also seen, let's say, at Miro and even at Amplitude, we have it on marketing of somebody that is responsible for that PQA and the handoff to sales and experimentation on the sales book. So it's not quite to the extent of what you're saying, but I'm already mm -hmm. seeing the industry move in that way because we do need a couple of things from sales that are outside of the core sales expertise, which is one really quick feedback loop. Yeah. We need to know what's working and what's not because that PQA definition needs to be iterated like there's no tomorrow. And then the second of all, we need somebody on product that is actually responsible for pipeline. And product managers usually go, oh, pipeline, that's, not, that's marketing responsibility. But we actually need to shift that because in the triage yeah. of product marketing and sales, in sales-led organizations, you typically have product that builds product and marketing and sales sell it. And now we need to shift the roles and say product and sales work closely together because product is able to build it, sell itself and transition it to sales and marketing enables all. That's, that's so exactly product and right sales right. need to work close together, not yeah. marketing and sales. Exactly. And that just like, I don't know, that just like blows people's minds away. And I'm like, no, I, I'm, it's I'm the only you. way to actually work. I 100% with you. I, I I don't know, like, so now I don't know whether it's going to be a growth team or a product team, because I don't know whether you need access to monetization, because that would be a classical growth team that adds sales. Sure. I, I don't think you need that. So that's why I'm going more with mm. the product thing. So that's, that's what I, I think, think it's going to be a growth. We'll see what it's actually going to turn out. Let's revisit. Okay. This okay. No, no. So I'm going to do this just first in the company where I am just out of spite. So I can say like, look, it happened here first. <laughs> I hope, I hope nobody's Do listening. Do it. <laughs> you would not dare to change your organization just for a bit. Um, no, but I think I think it's going to happen. So this is going to be super interesting. All right. We're almost at time, unfortunately. We did not speak about 90% of what we had on the list. Um, so so that was really great. But um, Elena, like, how can people be the most amazing thing for you? How should people reach out for you? What is what is your next uh, thing that you want to do? Like, should people reach out uh, to you on LinkedIn or should they go to your website, which is elenaverno.com or like, what should they do? Yeah, uh, obviously I post stuff on LinkedIn. I translate a lot of it onto my website, um, which is just becoming a repository of my memes my frameworks and my little write-ups that, that I do. Uh, you can try to reach out to me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn messaging sucks. If you work at LinkedIn or if you're working on LinkedIn and you're listening to this, please fix inbox and messaging and categorization and the way Plus one. that reminders yes. work, please, because my inbox and LinkedIn is out of control. But the way that you can help me is um, engage with me on content, uh, share your learnings, so I can learn from you. That's my biggest ask of anybody. I try to share everything that I know or any ideas that I come up, return the favor. And that's the biggest handshake that you can have yeah. with me. After, after this podcast, I will start following you. Okay. Maybe I'm going to engage. Oh, thank well. you. <laughs> okay. I made it. I made it. Leah's going to follow me. <laughs> I am, I'm gracious today. You know, <laughs> this is what it is. All right, Elena, it was, um, it was amazing. Uh, unfortunately, we have to do this again <laughs> for the rest of the topics. <laughs> so yes. thank you so much. And um, yeah, have a nice day wherever you are. Yeah, you too. Bye.